output of ours uh, do not uh, impact on elsewhere in the system. And of course, we would be probing that very carefully indeed. Thank you. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question one, Keza Dugdale. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Keza Dugdale. President Officer, we all celebrate the dedication of the people who work in our NHS. Every Scot has their own personal reason to be thankful for the care and the compassion of the dedicated staff. Since devolution, there has been much progress, but clearly there are problems in Scotland's NHS. Can the First Minister tell the Chamber whether the number of patients in Scotland waiting over 12 hours in A&E has gone up or down since 2008, the first full year for which figures are available? First Minister. Well, there are challenges in our accident and emergency departments, as has been uh, discussed in this chamber before and as I am happy to discuss in this chamber today. This government is investing in our NHS to help it deal with the challenges. Um, I, though, am proud on behalf of our hard-working NHS staff to say that over this challenging winter period, uh, nine out of ten patients were admitted within four hours, uh, and 99.9% .9 of patients were admitted within 12 hours. Now, let me also readily say that as long as any patient is waiting longer than four hours, we have work to do. But that's why yesterday we proposed a budget that increased health spending Absolutely. next year by £383 million. Perhaps Labour will be able to explain today why they voted against that budget. President officer, if that was a budget worth voting for, we would have done it, but it doesn't stand up for our NHS. The reality is that the number of Scots waiting 12 hours in accident and emergency has increased by 170%. That's pensioners sitting in cold waiting rooms hoping they will get called next. It's worried parents waiting hours for their child to get the treatment they need. It's a full-blown a &E crisis on the SNP's watch. Can the First Minister tell us whether the number of patients in Scotland waiting longer than eight hours in a &E has gone up or down since 2008? First Minister. Well, let me answer uh, that question uh, precisely. In 2007-08, uh, 0.16% uh, waited over eight hours. Uh, in 2014, 15, 0.64%, less than 1%. Now, I think that is too many, but this is a government that is investing in our health service to make sure that we equip it to deal with those challenges. It's only a few weeks ago that Labour uh, were saying that 12,000 patients over the last two years had waited more than 12 weeks uh, for inpatient treatment in our health service. Now, that's 12,000 patients too many. I don't have any issue admitting that. But under the last two years of the last Labour administration, 267,000 patients waited more than 12 weeks. So I accept that we have work to do. We will always have work to do to support our NHS, deliver even better for patients. But the simple fact of the matter is this. Our NHS today is performing better against tougher targets than was the case under Labour in the past and is the case under Labour in Wales today. Perhaps that's why twice as many people in Scotland trust the SNP with our National Health Service than trust Labour. President officer, if this was the Welsh Assembly, that would have been a good response, but it's not. The First Minister is responsible. Order! Order! Let us hear Ms Dugdale. Order! Officer, the First Minister is responsible for the Western General, not the Royal Glamorgan, and it's about time she took responsibility for it. I asked her whether the number uh, of people being treated for eight hours had gone up or down under the SNP. The reality is it's gone up by 400%. 400%. Think what that means. It's a worker losing the equivalent of a whole day as they wait in A&E waiting to be seen. It was 10,000 Scots in 2014 alone. I'll give the First Minister one more chance to be straight with a question. 
Tell us, First Minister, how many patients in Scotland waited longer than four hours in a &E before being seen in 2014? First Minister. I answered the question uh, that Kezia Dugdale answered Order. me absolutely Order. precisely. Order. Last year, the First Minister. Absolutely precisely uh, in terms of eight hours. 0.16% in 2007 and 0.64%. I, I do not deny we have work to do in our health service. We have work to do in our accident and emergency departments. There were a record number of people admitted to our hospitals through accident and emergency in December last year. The demographics of our country and indeed every part of the UK mean that more people are being admitted to hospital in a yep. sicker state and requiring hospital stays. That is the reality we're dealing with, which is why since this government took office, the health budget has increased yep. by three billion pounds. There are almost three times the number of consultants working in our National Health Service, accident and emergency consultants working in our National Health Service. And of course, there are two accident and emergency departments that together have treated almost a million patients since this government took office that Labour would have closed if they had won the 2007 election. Now, Labour doesn't like to be reminded of its own record and it doesn't like to be reminded of the records of its counterparts in Wales. But the reality is this, presiding officer, people will judge the SNP's record on health and I am happy that they do so, but they will also want to judge whether Labour can be trusted to run our National Health Service. And they will look either at Labour's past record in Scotland or Labour's current record in the only part of the UK where they're in government, which is Wales, and they'll find that on both of these measures, Labour cannot be trusted with our health service. And they will choose to keep moving forward with our NHS under the SNP and not go back to the bad old days of Labour. Okay, the First Minister didn't answer the question, so let me give her the number. The reality is that in the last year, more than 120,000 Scots waited more than four hours in A&E. That's enough people to fill Hampden Park and Murrayfield and still have some left over. President Officer, the SNP's record on A&E is one of failure. We know from this week's figures that A&Es in Scotland are performing even worse than David Cameron's ones in England. They claim the NHS is a priority, but this is the First Minister who gave up running the NHS to run the referendum. The First Minister once said, a party that is now in its second term of office cannot avoid taking responsibility for its own failings. When will the First Minister live up to her own words and get a grip of the crisis in Scotland's A&E? First Minister. First Minister. Order. First Minister. Okay, well, let me give... Kezia Dugdale, some more facts. In 2013-14, 99,152 patients waited longer than four hours in our accident emergency departments. That is not good enough. In 2006-07, the last year when Labour were in government, 125,753 patients waited longer than four hours. So our NHS has still got work to do. This government will support them in doing it, but we will not go back to the bad old days of Labour. And while Labour criticise an A&E performance of 90% in Scotland, uh, they seem to want to defend a performance where they're in government in Wales of 81%. So I've read all week, I've read all week that Labour want to make the NHS Order. a central issue in the next election. Well, let me say this to Labour, bring it on. Ruth Davidson. Ms Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the First Minister when she'll next meet the Prime Minister. First Minister. No plans in the near future. Ruth Davidson. Thank you. Presiding Officer, this week we found out that the police in Scotland had stopped and searched hundreds of children under the age of 12. For our youngest children, 159 were stopped in Scotland, aged nine and under. In London, with millions more people and higher crime, that number was just 19. Everyone in this chamber has nieces and nephews or children or grandchildren. So can I ask the First Minister how she feels about children as young as five being stopped by the police, primary school children being approached by uniformed officers asking to search them 
and them not knowing if they're allowed to say no. How does she feel about that? First Minister. Well, can I say, uh, firstly, in relation to the issue of stops and searches of children, clearly this is an issue that many people will have concerns around. Uh, when the police search children, it is generally to ensure that they are safe and we understand a proportion of these searches are because drugs or weapons uh, may have been concealed by others on very young Order. children. The number of children being stopped and searched has reduced dramatically and the Scottish Police Authority has asked uh, Police Scotland to provide a full explanation of the figures that we have seen this week and this matter will be discussed at the next uh, public board meeting of the Scottish Police Authority. But I'm grateful to Ruth Davidson for raising what I think is an important issue. I have spoken to the Chief Constable about stop and search and I can advise Parliament that following a six-month pilot in Fife, he is now considering whether the practice of non-statutory or consensual stop and search should be completely ended and I welcome this. Of course, we need to ensure that the public can continue to be properly protected if that practice comes to an end. I have therefore asked Police Scotland to consult with the Scottish Police Authority and Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary on the way forward. I've asked that the Justice Secretary is updated before the end of March and I give an assurance that Parliament will also be kept fully updated. Ruth Davidson. I thank the presiding officer for that full answer. Um, I'm not First afraid... Minister. First Minister, sorry. Uh, I, I'm not afraid to say that stopping and searching children makes me feel uncomfortable and I'm someone who believes that the police do a tough job and should be supported, that believes that all prisoners should serve their full sentence and that some prisoners should never get out at all. But I think there is something different about young children being targeted in this way. And it's not just me because out with the conversation the First Minister has just described with the Chief Constable, in June the Assistant Chief Constable Wayne Mawson came to Holyrood and told MSPs that searching children younger than 12 was, and I quote, indefensible and that it would be scrapped. Well, it hasn't been yet, and hundreds of children have been searched by the police on our streets since that appearance. So can I ask the First Minister, how can it happen? How can a senior ranking officer come to Holyrood and tell Parliament that officers are regularly doing something that even the police considers indefensible, and then walk out the front door and carry on regardless. Is it acceptable? First Minister. I, I did say in my original answer to Ruth Davidson that the Scottish Police Authority has asked for a full explanation of the very circumstance that Ruth Davidson outlines, and I hope she will welcome that. And as I also said, this is a, an issue that will be discussed in detail at the next board meeting of the SPA, uh, which is held in public and will be held later this month. And I think that is an important assurance for Parliament on the particular issue that she has raised. But I think it's also uh, worth noting that the number of children being stopped and searched has reduced uh, significantly. But the wider issue, I think, is an important one. Stop and search, as I hope everybody across this chamber would agree with, can be and often is a vital tool that the police have at their disposal to keep us safe. But there is a concern, and it has been expressed not just by politicians, but by the Scottish Human Rights Commission, that the use of consensual non-statutory stop and search raises issues. And those are the issues that the Chief Constable is acknowledging. And that is why there will now be consultation about bringing that practice to an end. And I hope that members across the chamber will welcome that. But I want to end uh, this answer, presiding officer, by picking up on something that Ruth Davidson alluded to. Our police do a sterling job. They do a tough job. They put their lives on the line every time they put on their uniform and go out to keep the rest of us safe. And we should all thank them for the job that they do. Michael Russell. Uh, Presiding officer, can I ask the First Minister if she will seek an urgent opportunity to personally ask the leader of uh, Argyll and Butte Council, Councillor Dick Walsh, to accept the bid for Castle Tower of £850,000, which the South Cowell Community Development Company has now lodged. That bid will lead to 100 jobs being created in the area, but it will fall in a week's time unless the Council chooses to get out of the way of the community and actually stop obstructing them in their desire to own the premises. First Minister. Well, under the community right to buy legislation, the decision on whether to accept the bid, of course, lies with our Gail and Butte Council, but there's no doubt 
that the community in South Cowell is highly supportive of the buyout and the potential that it has to create new jobs. Last week, the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, Communities and Pensioners' Rights asked the Council to consider uh, the new valuation of the estate and to extend the right to buy deadline to allow time for further discussions, which I know was welcomed uh, by Mr Russell. I would encourage the Council to negotiate constructively with the community body and use the extension now agreed to come to a solution that would secure the future of this very important community asset. Order Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the crisis in Murray schools. There are 70 vacant teaching posts to cover as well as high levels of sick leave. And I understand Keith Grammar School has no English teachers at all, while others have had to close due to the lack of teachers. And council officers are now routinely returning to the classroom to keep schools open. This is due to a lack of teachers. Can we just get a question, What please? is the First Minister doing to address this and to make sure that there are adequate numbers of teachers to provide education to the children of Murray? First Minister. Well, we will work and are very happy to work with individual councils to help them deal with recruitment issues. Councils have the ability, if they so choose, if they have particular recruitment challenges, to pay higher salary levels than the national uh, levels in place. We're also taking steps to increase the number of teachers in training and to make sure that probationer uh, teachers can go to areas uh, of particular difficulties in recruitment. But can I say, uh, right now, in terms of teacher numbers, uh, we have, as a government, right now, £51 million of money yeah. on the table available to councils yeah. if they agree to maintain teacher numbers. And I would hope that every member of this chamber would say to councils across Scotland to accept that deal take the money and allow us to make sure we keep teachers in our schools to give the best deal to our children. Question three, Willow Rennie. Uh, to ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, matters of importance to the people of Scotland. Willow Rennie. Uh, I'm looking for some clarity from the First Minister on what she's just said about stop and search. It was quite clear that the senior police officer who came to this Parliament back in June said that under 12s, stop and searching would be stopped there and then. I have here, from a freedom of information request, that the stop and search would end from June. But since then, over 350 young children have been stopped and searched. Now, what she's referred to is the pilot in Fife, which was for over 12-year-olds. Can she give absolute clarity from today there will be no more stopping and searching of children under the age of 12? First Minister. Well, can I thank Willie Rennie and indeed can I take the opportunity to say uh, that Willie Rennie has raised this issue consistently and uh, I think it's important to recognise this. It, absolutely, let me be very clear, it is the uh, position of Police Scotland that they do not uh, carry out consensual stops and searches on children under 12. That is the position. Now, there will be circumstances in which, as we've seen from the figures, uh, those are carried out and that is what the Scottish Police Authority has asked Police Scotland to give an explanation for. I don't want to prejudge what that explanation is but that will be something that is discussed in public at the next board meeting of the Scottish Police Authority. Uh, but the wider issue, and he's absolutely right, and when I referred to the Fife pilot, of course I was not talking about under 12s, I was talking about the policy of consensual stop and search more generally. Uh, what the Chief Constable has indicated to me, and I welcome this, is that he now wants to move to a situation where the practice of consensual stop and search is ended for everyone, ended completely. Now, there's a process of consultation that needs to be gone through with the police authority and with Her Majesty's uh, Inspector of Constabulary. It's important that that process takes place and that we make sure that as that change is made, the police are nevertheless able to protect the population as we would expect them to do. But I would hope, given his interest in this subject, this is a development that Willie Rennie will welcome. Will there any? If that is the outcome, I certainly would welcome it, and I'm, I'm grateful for the First Minister responding in the way that she has. The Chief Constable better have a good explanation as to why for six months there has been continued stopping and searching for under-12s, and I hope that she demands that explanation. I mean, Liberals <coughs> cherish policing by consent. We've been very concerned about the extent of the use of consensual stop and search, over 400,000 in the last year alone. There is one solution that is in her hands. In England, they have outlawed the use of consensual stop and search, as it's called. It's not very consensual in my opinion. But so she could make it the law in this parliament for Scotland 
that there is no more consensual stop and search in Scotland. We wouldn't have to wait for the Chief Constable. She could make that decision. Is that something that she will consider? First month. I, I'm happy to give consideration to that, but Willie Rennie, who knows the parliamentary legislative process as well as I do, uh, would understand that going down that route is likely to take longer than the process of consultation that I've just spoken about. Now, it may be there is an argument for doing that on a belt and braces approach, and I'm very happy to give that consideration. But what I have shared with Parliament today is the desire of the Chief Constable to move to the position that Willie Rennie wants to get to. Now, we have in this chamber before heard... I think it's fair to use the word criticisms of Police Scotland, not all criticisms that I would have agreed with about lack of consultation around certain aspects of operational policing. So I think it's right and proper that Police Scotland now do consult with their partners in the SPA and in uh, Her Majesty's Inspectorate. Uh, but there is no uh, question that that is the direction of travel that they want to, to go in. In terms of the first part of Willie Rennie's question about the under 12 position, I've already uh, outlined the action that the SPA are taking there, uh, and I'm sure all members will have the opportunity to scrutinise that in due course. Question four, Roderick Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what support the Scottish Government provides to people with dementia and their uh, carers. First uh, we have a three-year strategy to improve dementia care in hospitals, in addition to funding for dementia drawn from existing NHS board allocations and indeed local authority allocations. The Scottish Government part funds an Alzheimer's Scotland dementia nurse consultant in each territorial NHS board. To date, around 300,000 has also been invested in training more than 500 dementia champions to support healthcare staff. And we invest 500,000 each year in education and training for the dementia workforce to help support services deliver high quality and effective care to people with dementia. Our dementia strategy includes a commitment to earlier identification of people who need palliative care and we're developing a strategic framework for action for palliative and end-of-life care which is due to be published in the spring. Roderick Cam. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Can I congratulate Tommy Whitelaw on his British Citizen Award for his campaigning work on issues surrounding dementia last week? And can I also just refer to the, the Marie Curie recent report, which makes it clear that for end-of-life care for dementia sufferers is far from universal. And whilst I welcome the First Minister's comments, uh, I would be grateful for further clarification as to what steps the Scottish Government can take to address that issue. First Minister. Well, firstly, can I second uh, Roderick Campbell's congratulations to Tommy Whitelaw, who I'm very proud to say is a, a good friend of mine. He has done sterling work to raise awareness of dementia and indeed carers' issues, and I'm sure the whole Parliament will want to congratulate him on his British Citizen Award. I also, I also know as a very important contribution to this issue, the Marie Curie uh, report that Rod Campbell referred to. Uh, as I indicated in my earlier answer, we are developing a palliative and end-of-life care strategic framework for action, uh, and that will be intended to further improve the delivery of palliative and end-of-life care for all across uh, all health and care settings. That will be published in this spring. Uh, the right to end-of-life care in the dementia standards, which were published in 2011, includes the right to good quality, dignified and compassionate palliative and end-of-life care in all settings. Wherever possible, people have the right to die in the place of their own choosing and in a way which respects previously expressed wishes. And it's important that we ensure that right is afforded to those with dementia, as we seek to do for others as well. Richard Simpson. Uh, presiding officer, can I welcome the First Minister's attention to the uh, end of life care for people with dementia, but I wonder how she responds to the comments this week from one of our foremost exponents of best care for those with dementia, who described hospitals as dangerous places for these patients. And I ask this given that the Health Improvement Scotland have found that 50% of the records they examined in their elderly care inspections had no cognitive assessment recorded. And Labour's Freedom of Information inquiry has shown that almost all health boards, there was no linkage between the cognitive assessment when it was done and boarding out, which is particularly dangerous for those patients with dementia. Uh, what uh, powers will she give to the Health Improvement Scotland to ensure these patients are not put at this additional risk? First one. Uh, well, Health Improvement Scotland uh, already inspects older people's services in hospitals and it's important that they continue to do that. I think Richard Simpson raises some uh, very important issues. Uh, Professor June Andrews, whose work he has referred to, uh, Professor Andrews does uh, fantastic work around dementia care and is an acknowledged and recognised expert in her field. The issues she has raised 
around the care for people with dementia in hospital settings are important ones. They're ones that the Scottish Government is aware of and is working uh, through in, in order that we can pick up and respond to the points that June Andrews and others uh, have made. It is absolutely vital, and you know, I remember uh, discussing this with health boards a lot when I was health secretary, and I know my successors in this post have done so as well. Uh, when somebody with dementia is admitted to hospital, there are a whole range of issues that arise for them that do not arise for other patients. And we have a duty to make sure that our hospital settings do not make their condition or their circumstances worse, but are responsive to the particular needs that they have. And I can give Richard, uh, Richard Simpson an assurance that we will continue to work hard to make sure the level of care is continually improved for people with dementia. Question five, Jenny Murrah. To ask the First Minister when the Scottish Government will introduce its accident and emergency target to see 98% of patients within four hours. First Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government aim for 98% of emergency patients to be treated, admitted or discharged within four hours remains in place. Janet Mara. Well, I'm surprised to hear, since uh, the First Minister downgraded our targets last, uh, last week to 95%, but, presiding officer, it is a confident government that has nothing to hide, and it is in the interests of patients and the public that we know how our health service is performing. It's a pretty bad situation when David Cameron is publishing accident and emergency statistics four times as often as the First Minister. Will the First Minister agree in the public interest to publish weekly accident and emergency information? First Minister. Well, firstly, can I say that the any target has not been downgraded. Scotland, I think, is the only part of the UK that has a target of 98%. What we have said is that we need to get health boards performing sustainably at 95% as an interim uh, target and then take them to 98%. Now, I, I don't know what Labour uh, find to disagree with about that because that shows the level of ambition yeah. we have for the Absolutely. performance Absolutely. of our hospitals. In terms of... In terms of the frequency of the publication of a &E stats, I want us to be as open as possible uh, with the public. As of now, we are moving to monthly publication instead of quarterly publication of our a &E stats. And I can tell the Chamber today that I have asked officials uh, to look at the possibility of moving to weekly publication. Uh, we have nothing to hide. Our health service and our accident emergency departments are working under pressure. We all know that. But this government is determined to support them in making the improvements that people have a right to see. Question number six, Rob Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government is taking to encourage voter registration. First Minister. Well, as uh, members will be aware, today is National Voter Registration Day, uh, which makes this question particularly timely. And I would take the opportunity to encourage all those across Scotland who are not registered to vote to sign up and make their voice heard. Uh, in summer last year, the Scottish Government undertook a consultation exercise seeking views on how we can improve the quality of democracy by encouraging wider engagement and participation in elections. Since then, of course, the record registration and participation levels in the referendum have demonstrated the huge appetite for participating in the democratic process. Our programme for government sets out our commitment to build on that success by using the lessons from the referendum and the consultation findings to continue the process of making voting more meaningful for our people across our communities. Rob Gibson. I thank First Minister for her uh, answer. BBC uh, Sunday Politics stated uh, last weekend that uh, 590,000 Scottish voters have yet to be transferred to the new register due to be published in March. What influence can the Scottish Government bring to bear on the Electoral Commission in Scotland to ensure that the extremely unhelpful language in their letters to potential voters is modified and to, give a re, uh, to help the electoral uh, registration officers uh, to be able to ensure that the huge numbers registered before the referendum get registered to vote in May and for the Holyrood election next year. First Minister. <clears throat> Uh, well, the Scottish Government works closely with the Electoral Commission. My officials meet regularly with them. I'm sure they will pay attention to uh, the terms of Rob Gibson's question today, and I'll certainly make sure uh, that it is uh, related to them. Uh, the Commission has, of course, confirmed that no voter 
will be removed from the register before May's general election. Uh, and we understand, though, that the Commission will report on the progress of the transition to IER following the publication of the register on the 2nd of March. Um, I'm sure we're all concerned that the register should be as complete as possible, and I welcome the Commission's assurance that any report on progress towards uh, IER will take full account of the risk of any voter being removed from the register in advance of the 2016 Scottish Parliament elections. I will ask to be kept on, updated on this as we move towards the next election and in turn I will ensure that Parliament is kept updated as well. Briefly, Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I wonder if the First Minister would agree with me that someone like me who stayed in the same house for over 20 years and have just been removed from the register. I just hope that the commitment that's been made by the Electoral, Registration, the Electoral Commission can be followed through, that no one's removed from the register in 2015. And in these circumstances, uh, obviously I'm dealing with my own circumstances, in these circumstances, can we make sure that the Electoral Commission are told that the letters they are sending out are much more succinct and much more focused on the actual issues involved? First Minister. I can't, I, I can't help just find myself uh, hoping that uh, Mr Crawford's wife is not trying to tell him something after <laughs> his 20 years in, in the same house. But he raises an important point, and I think the important part of the answer uh, to give to this is that the Electoral Commission has given an assurance uh, that no electors in Scotland or indeed elsewhere in Great Britain will be removed from the registers ahead of the UK Parliament election in May. Now, there is an issue that will arise in terms of the 2016 election, depending on when the deadline for IER transition is set. Currently, that's set to be December 2016. If that continues to be the case, then no elector would be removed uh, before that either, and that would cover the Scottish Parliament election. If, though, the option is exercised to bring that forward to December 2015, the issue of the Scottish Parliament election would arise, and that's why the assurances that we're getting from the Electoral Commission are so important. This is a vitally important issue, presiding officer. We want, particularly after the referendum, to see as many people as possible uh, vote. Uh, I can assure you, given some of the recent polls, I definitely want to see as many people as possible vote in the general election, and it's absolutely vital that they get the chance to do so. That ends First Minister's questions. We now move to members' business. Members who are leaving the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.